take the virtual platform here, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Walter Korschetz, who is the director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. So he joined NINDS in 2007 as the deputy director, and it was in 2015 when Dr. Collins selected him as the next director of NINDS. It's really been a pleasure working with him. Um, he received his, uh, his uh, I guess, his bachelor's degree from Georgetown University and his medical degree from the University of Chicago. So he trained in internal medicine at the University of Chicago and Massachusetts General Hospital. He then trained in neurology and neuroscience at MGH and Harvard Neurobiology. So he's focusing on how synaptic mechanisms might contribute to neuronal death. So Walter, it's uh, just a real pleasure to have you here and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, give a presentation. I think it's on the exposome in neuroscience, if, if I remember correctly. So I'll turn the virtual, uh, platform over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rick, and thanks to the council members for listening. Um, as I usually do, I like to talk to smart people about my problems. And my problem is trying to understand environmental influences that go to drive uh, neurological disorders. Uh, as you know, Gary hinted, we've learned a tremendous amount from genetics, but we're now see seeing kind of the ceiling. And uh, the ceiling is, is pretty high uh, in the sense that there's a lot of space that the genetics is not gonna give us answers to. And, and, and so really trying to make a difference in the neurologic conditions we, we absolutely have to get a better handle on these quote unquote environmental in influences and how they interact with the genetics. I'm gonna to talk to you today, just a brief overview of the Institute and then really get into the meat of the matter, which is NINDS and the neural exposome. Uh, so uh, we are dealing with a significant number of problems, the diseases that can be counted in our institute number about 400, depending on how you lump them. Um, and together with the mental health disorders, chronic pain, uh, traumatic brain injury, stroke, uh, these nervous system disorders account for the leading cause of disability in the United States. And, and as the population ages around the world, around the world as well. Uh, so our mission at the institute is to invest across the spectrum of research, we'll talk a little bit about in a second, um, but also to always keep our eyes on where are the gaps in research and the gaps in public health needs. And as I mentioned earlier, the biggest gap of all is understanding um, the exposome's influence on neurological disorders. Um, and what we've learned, and certainly I learned in my career that uh, the problems uh, are, don't change that much year to year. And in actual fact, the people aren't really smarter than they were you know, years ago, but the big difference is that we have better tools. And so um, uh, very interested in supporting development of tools that will now enable questions that could be answered before to come to the table for answers. Um, and then, you know, we're trying to listen uh, it's a much, we're kind of a strict pay line institute. So we're, we're really uh, less top down uh, and more bottom up, uh, but certainly listening to know where we should be top down is important. And we're always trying to improve. We're trying to build a better diverse workforce. So our research funding is, is split between these three different areas. So basic research about 20 to 25 for our percent of our budget is how the nervous system works. That's disease agnostic. About 50 to 60% is about mechanisms of diseases, neurological diseases. And that, of course, that then adds to the, you know, adds up to be the, the largest percent of our budget is basic neuroscience. Um, you know, the other things, the translation of the clinical industry is somewhat involved, disease organizations, somewhat involved, but if we don't do the basic research, it, it doesn't get done. And that's really a foundation for everything that comes next. <laughs> but um, because the pharmaceutical industries ha ha have been burned so badly by their forays into neurological disorders, many of them have closed down 
their neuroscience divisions. And, um, and so what we decided to do is to basically start what is, you know, just crudely described as a virtual pharmaceutical company within the NINDS with people who um, came from the industry when those programs were shut down. So we have a group uh, that's very sophisticated in uh, the development of new therapies, whether biologics, small molecules, or even now gene therapy. And we work with all the blueprint for neuroscience institutes, which includes NIHS, um, to make that kind of expertise available so that um, if there are translational programs for many of the institutes, they can be supported through the blueprint. And, um, and the purpose of that is actually to bring things to to all the, through all the steps that are required for FDA, IND, or IDE. And then we have a division of clinical research that does clinical trials. We have uh, networks, uh, one network called Neuronext that does phase two trials. So they're trying to de-risk this process of translation. Uh, so the biotech companies or academics can come in and do a, a phase two trial in patients with a particular neurologic condition. It's, it can do almost any neurologic condition. We have another one for stroke that's special for stroke. Um, and uh, we just put out our strategic plan and it, you know, it has these four pillars, which are not, uh, I suspect, which are common among the other institutes. We're very interested in trying to prove the rigor and the quality of our research. Um, We'll get into that in a second. We're very interested in training the, the next generation of scientists because we think that with the new tools, they're going to be even more effective than the current generation. Um, and then communication I mentioned and culture of the Institute is, is, is risen as importance. And so uh, we have uh, considerable efforts now to improve uh, our workforce culture. Uh, there are a couple of cross cutting strategies. I mentioned rigor and transparency in research. So uh, we've been working for years, probably 10 years now to improve um, the methods reporting at journal articles um, so that uh, the, the, the work can be, can be evaluated rigorously. Uh, and we are you know, basically been calling for the inclusion of just basic measures of uh, sample size prediction, blinding assessments, um, using appropriate statistics. And, uh, and I think that's caught on a bit at the, at the journals. We are now currently working to set up a program of developing tools, um, mostly educational tools that will be then validated and available for use that would improve uh, the rigor of research in laboratories around the country. Um, most of our research is investigator initiated research, probably 70%. Um, but we are now trying to think seriously about moving more into a team science or developing mechanisms for team science when it's appropriate. And we'll talk about the BRAIN initiative, which is really our first foray into, into big team science on the basic side. And, um, and we've certainly seen uh, that, that just to solve some of these big problems, you really do need big teams. And the other thing we've seen talking to younger folks is that a, a number of them uh, are much more interested in going into team science and being, you know, investing, you know, PIs in laboratories. So there may be a change in culture there too. Data sharing is a big problem for us. Um, just the expense of, of making data available. Um, we, you know, we haven't really figured at that out. We have a number of pilots. So talk to you about. Neuroethics is important. Um, and it, we got heavily into it with the BRAIN Initiative, which we'll mention, uh, which is developing technologies to basically monitor neural activity and then modulate neural activity. And the tools are very impressive in animals now, but we also have some pretty interesting tools that are also in people, people with epilepsy, people with Parkinson's disease, where um, they have been instrumented in, and there are now uh, devices that can read the neural activity. Um, an example of being able to read the neural activity from motor speech cortex and predict what someone is saying 
without them saying anything. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, this brings up some significant neuroethic issues for society in general. Um, patient engagement is another area of greater interest in the last couple of years, particularly um, with the idea that our research, particularly the clinical research, um, has to be done with people with lived experience as part of the research teams is, is kind of the, the summary there. But we think that will make our research more successful, particularly in research and dis, uh, in, in disadvantaged populations. Uh, where, as you'll see, we don't have a lot of investigators, you know, PhDs or MD investigators who came from disadvantage, but we have lots of patients and, and they can be partners uh, as, well as, uh, as well as investigators. Um, technology, I mentioned, incredibly important. The models that we use in neuroscience research span you know, just about every organ you can imagine, but there are some things that you cannot study uh, except in, in an organism that's closest to a human. So non-human primate research, really important to us for, uh, for, for that type of uh, uh, investigation into circuits that don't exist in, in other uh, organisms. Collaboration, here we are. This is really important to us, the collaboration we'll talk about today with NIEHS. <coughs> and then diversity and inclusion, as all the institutes working with the UNITE program and NIH are now more invested in, so we. Um, we have uh, had a longstanding uh, group working to improve uh, diversity in our workforce. And we've had some successful programs, particularly with the blueprint for neuroscience that I said at NIHS is involved in reaching out to undergrads. Um, and this has been really quite good where uh, Folks uh, uh, show a success rate of about 65% from this undergraduate program going on to PhDs in neuroscience. And many of the others are going on to things like MDs. Um, so we think that uh, really reaching out uh, to a younger poor population is really important in trying to uh, keep our pipeline flowing. But um, also along with um, uh, the rest of uh, NIH were looking for the first award program to help get place people into academic jobs so that the, you know, that, that cohort hiring model would allow a group to come in, be hired as part of the first award program and help themselves to uh, be successful as well as garner enough interest from the universities to make sure they're successful. And also importantly, I think that also helps the trainees see that there is diversity in the academic labs and that potentially would help reduce this leak from the pipeline that we're seeing. Health disparities, important in, in neurologic conditions. Over the years, we spent most of our time in stroke where there are unbelievably tragic figures with uh, stroke mortality and incidence rates like three times higher in African-American uh, than, than Caucasians. So it's not low effect size, it's gigantic effects. And, uh, and, and we haven't really been able to bridge that gap um, in, in terms of reducing the disparities. Uh, we've done a lot of epidemiologic work and we're now gonna push towards much more on the intervention side of things. Um, and when you think about, you know, this was mentioned, I think a little bit in the questions to Gary that, um, when you think about the exposome, uh, the issues that come up in disparities, health disparities are really part and parcel exposome. So when you see, you see genetics might be part of this one box here, biological variability mechanism, but everything else is the environmental influences on health. So very relevant the exposome uh, to trying to deal with and understand at you know, a real mechanistic level, how are these things causing trouble? So let me run into what I, my thoughts about the neuroexposure. Now, I apologize, you may see it, feel this is pretty naive, but I always start from the beginning and uh, certainly spent a lot of time thinking about it when uh, I worked with Deborah Corey Selector on this National Academy of Medicine workshop on environmental neuroscience. And 
I think, you know, the take home point and uh, Rick was there. I think he could attest to it that we have these groups of, at this workshop, we have these groups of people um, from the environmental sciences and from neuroscience. And this is a select group um, where they kind of touch each other, um, but it's not, you know, it's uh, still kind of social distancing or intellectual distancing, let me say. So trying to bring these two areas of science closer together seems to be, you know, a win-win for everyone. Um, and so that's kind of what started off my thinking here. Um, and of course, you know, the issues uh, in terms of those features that, that, um, that feed into your exposome, I think Gary talked to those better than I can, but on the, but on the contrary, in the nervous system, here, um, you know, what we would like to be able to do is to go from, say, the population data to a mechanistic basis of action of uh, probably a series of environmental exposures, maybe not a single one. If we're lucky, there may be some single factors that, um, that are driving disease, and we'll talk about, you know, potential coming up in a bit. Um, but in the nervous system, uh, what you can't do is to treat it like some kind of a tissue culture or a gland. The nervous system is basically a computer. And so if you treat it like a homogeneous group of cells, uh, all bets are off on, on, on whether you're not ever going to ha have impact. And, and it's not just a static computer, but it, you know, it, it's it basically during development, it starts out, you know, with, uh, one or two chips, and then you end up with 85 billion chips, uh, and they're all arranged in in a, in a very important uh, connectome. And so, how that happens, and how the exposome uh, can affect that from occurring in the fetus or in you know, the young child, um, certainly that's got to be really important to understand. There certainly is data out there. Um, uh, from animal studies and human studies on how different stressors can affect this and certainly toxins, drugs. Um, just today, a paper came out, you know, there's been concern over the effect of uh, drugs, antileptic agents. Um, some women, when they're pregnant, won't take them because they're afraid they'll hurt the baby. We just, the study came out today showed that, you know, the ones they're using now, they don't see any effect on the child at two years. So, um, uh, so, so sometimes, you know, you need to kind of do those studies uh, to prove safety and, and they're long and difficult to do, but important in neurodevelopment. Now, again, I'm going to concentrate in the next couple of slides talking about the interfaces between the nervous system and the environment. And I think this is where the neuroscientists and the uh, environmental sciences uh, can come together where identify a particular set of uh, quote unquote, exposome features and test them at this interface because that's where the environment and the, and the nervous system meet. So people know about the blood, um, you know, pretty much, you know, lead toxicity, bloodborne goes of course into the brain, affects neurodevelopment. It's a good, a good uh, example there. Um, but there are some Funny things about the brain's blood vessels, and particularly the blood-brain barrier, is really unique, and it's got features that, um, that other capillary systems don't have. And also, it's dynamic, and so it can change, and that that itself can be a problem. So, say in COVID, the problem in the brain seems to be not the vi the virus getting into the brain, but it's the virus affecting the blood-brain barrier, allowing leaking. Of substances into the brain that don't belong there, uh, and they can be toxic and change, change, cause inflammation themselves. The other interface is the between the blood and the spinal fluid. So the spinal fluid is made by the choroid plexus, and it contributes to the interstitial fluid, which is coming out of the blood vessels that bathe all the nerve cells. Um, but there's also rushing that goes on of substances inside the brain moving along arterial and venous channels out into the spinal fluid, then back into the bloodstream. And, um, and also the, the 
the point about the blood CSF on this slide is that, you know, the brain is connected to the rest of the body. And that's the other problem, particularly neuroscientists uh, have, is that they oftentimes don't want to deal with that. Um, but the more we've learned, the more we find that particularly the immune system uh, from, uh, has tremendous, the, the blood-borne immune system has tremendous effects on in neurologic diseases. Multiple sclerosis is an example of multiple sclerosis where inflammatory cells go into the brain around, around venules and set up uh, a demyelination. Um, now, the other um, interact, interaction surface is uh, between the nerves themselves. And so the nerves are, they're really funny creatures. Um, if you think about a motor neuron, um, sits in the spinal cord, will send out an axon down to your toes, that will move your toes. So if you just think about that, so the example in my head is that if you could blow the cell body of the motor neuron up to, to a basketball, then the axon would be 1.5 miles long. So think about what a basketball sized cell body would have to do to keep the health of an axon that's one and a half miles long and all the action is going on at the end uh, where it's interacting with the muscles. So there's some really unique features and certainly the peripheral nerves, peripheral neuropathy, a very common problem and a large percentage of those have no known causes, but there are a ton of toxins that we know that cause peripheral neuropathies. Um, the autonomic nervous system is oftentimes been forgotten in the last 30 or 40 years, but it's now coming back <laughs> in a sense. Um, so there's nerves that go to the lacrimal gland to the eye, uh, the submandibular gland, the mouth, the, the intestines and the heart. Um, and, um, and these are also ways in which substances can come back to the, to the nervous system. It's not just a one-way street. There's movement of molecules to and fro along these axons. Uh, one example, we talk about Parkinson's disease. We'll talk about uh, synuclein, which is the signature aggregated protein in Parkinson's disease. Basically, it's been found in the submandibular glands um, as, uh, as a potential biomarker. Uh, and, and we'll talk about the fact that in Parkinson's, there's a strong body of evidence, not perfect yet, that the disease may actually start in the gut and move its way into the brain. And speaking of the gut, the enteric nervous system, again, not that well studied, uh, but now becoming more important. And we'll talk about it, Parkinson's in a second, but these nerves go and they interact with these enteroendocrine cells um, that are sitting in the gut epithelium. And they can also um, send signals back into the spinal cord and, and, and the brainstem. And so there's an interaction here between the gut and the nerves, the nose, the mouth, the eyes, the skin, um, or, or you know, huge surfaces um, where the nervous system is sensing things, but also uh, potential um, physical interactions with other maybe potentially dangerous molecules. So, so the synuclein story is uh, years ago, a um, pathologist named Brock um, put together evidence that uh, the synuclein aggregation, which is the signature of Parkinson's, begins in the enteric nerves, spreads into the spinal cord, up the spinal cord to the medulla, uh, or maybe from, from the vagus nerve into the medulla, and then up into the Nigra to cause the motor symptoms, and then further up into the cortex to cause Lewy bodies in the cortex and, and a dementing like syndrome. Um, it was the, the pathologic data was pretty convincing and got people to start looking. And this is an example of a study where you take these synuclein fibrils from a patient with Parkinson's and you inject them into the, the wall, the intestine. And what you see in the group from Dawson's lab at Hopkins is that in the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, you start to see the nuclein aggregation, you know, over the months after the injection. Uh, so, 
So proof that synuclein can actually do this if injected into the intestinal wall. Now, that got other people to start looking at what could be going on in the intestine. And uh, we don't know exactly, but there's some really interesting data coming out that there are actual bacteria that produce an amyloid protein called curly. It's part of the biofilm that E. coli uh, secretes uh, to protect itself and to attach to the wall of the intestine. And, and so experiments have shown that this, uh, this protein, which forms amyloids, and, and that's that that's protein aggregation, that's the same thing that synuclein does, um, it can cause synuclein to start to aggregate. Um, and so this is a synuclein stain here on the top. This is example of the the animals infected with E. coli in which the curly has been mutated out. This is the wild type E. coli. You can see all the synuclein, um, not just in the bowel, but also in the striatum of the brain, the hippocampus. And this is a control animal um, without the E. coli injected. We don't see any of that. So here in an animal model, you're basically setting up Parkinson's disease uh, by uh, giving a particular um, e. coli strain uh, to a rat. Um, and uh, so Sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay, sorry about that. And then on this side, you can see intestinal biopsy further with Parkinson's disease. And you can see uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is the control uh, and this is E. coli at that 40X, same 40X here. So you can see there's a lot more E. coli along the gastrointestinal wall, and there's more synuclein in the, um, in the enterochromaffin cells and the enteric nerves in the patient with Parkinson's. So this, you know, the example I use is just to, you know, you know, potentially we could get lucky. It could be something as simple as a bacteria that gives rise to Parkinson's. Um, I don't know if any internist here used to do gastric lavage for, for gastric ulcers before we knew it was H. pylori, but certainly that's always in the back of my mind that we could get lucky again. Um, so we have folks working on this. Um, there's a, a NIDDK and, and ourselves are having a conference about it coming up. Um, and um, now how do you get to, how do you get to the kind of, um, data to kind of really drive this kind of interaction home. Well, we're very good now, I think, you know, the last couple of years at looking at um, cellular, um, cellular characteristics, particularly at the transcriptomic level. So there's a large uh, project um, called Library of Integrated Network-Based Cellular Signals uh, done at NIH, the LINX program. We funded what's called Neural Links, which was basically looking at IPS cells from folks with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and spinal muscular atrophy. And this project was basically to set up these cellular assays and then to perturb them with a whole different series of pertogens, that is what they were called. So kind of an example of how you might screen, um, you know, if you have, a, a, as Gary said, a whole network of potential exposome uh, features that you think are causative, um, basically look at them in these cellular models is now something that's possible. And, um, and so, and it's actually, you know, quite the rage in, in a sense uh, uh, in many of our investigators. Now, in terms of, of getting to the tissue, um, it turns out that these genomic techniques have also completely opened the door 
uh, to a complete new way of looking at the brain. And that's looking at using single cell tools, high throughput single cell analysis to, um, to identify the cell types in the brain. Um, and this also, because each cell type has its own set of enhancers and promoters, it gives us genetic access to put in artificial genes, to either turn on or turn off those cells in response to a light stimulus or, or, or even ultrasound. Um, so we have these amazing tools that came out of, we call the cell census project that give us precise cell type specific manipulation and, and monitoring abilities. Um, and this is all out of the BRAIN initiative, which is called BRAIN Research to Advancing Innovative Technologies. And the purpose is to accelerate development of new technologies to look at brain circuits. So it's, it's solely focused on circuits. Um, and it's a partnership between five federal agencies and foundations. And um, we're in our second half of the BRAIN initiative now. And the, the idea going forward was um, that new directions are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution to explain old things in new ways, the effect of a tool-driven revolution to discover new things that have yet to be explained. And this indeed is really happening. <coughs> there are multiple different components of the BRAIN initiative. I won't go through all of them, but on this theme of the um, this cell census, this is just an example of a project that comes out looking at the motor cortex. And they're basically able to do single cell analysis at multiple different levels. So transcriptomics, location in the cortex, and then transcriptomic cell types. These different cells are, different, are, are working their ways into clusters that are related to the cell types seen here in color. And then each of these cells has been patch clamped <coughs> and their electrical activity is seen here on the bottom. You can see the actually electrical activity differs from cell type to cell type. And the shape of the cells, when they're patched, they're also filled with a dye to give out the shape. And you can see that the, the different colors are for different types of cells and they all have different shapes. So this is the kind of work that's going on now um, at a big level. So the Brain Initiative Cell Census Project is to identify and classify all the cell types in the cortex, uh, and then eventually entire mouse brain and then the human brain. And this is an example of a paper, it's in BioArchive, but there are 11 papers coming out of this project uh, in the next month or so. It's uh, authorship, you know, there's 600 different authors, um, there's 300 on this one. And they're doing what I just explained, um, in a but the difference here is they're also looking at how the cells are hooked up. So they're looking at the connectome of the cell in addition to all those single cell properties. Um, and they're using you know, the single cell transcomic methods, um, uh, particularly nuclear RNA and also a taxi looking at the epigenome. And so um, the, the this, this, I think, is the first stage to develop, you know, kind of the normative uh, cell type specific atlas based on these characteristics. But the next stage, and it's already starting, probably prematurely starting, is people are now starting to look at these single cell uh, techniques in disease states. And there, what you will see initially is you'll see a dropout of a certain cell type. But that's not really the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing is going to be the differentiation of the cell states. So you have cell types, but as they get sick, they're going to change their state. And this is this is what I think is really going to uh, change neuropathology. It's now going to be a study of how an individual in you know in a in one brain you can see the whole spectrum of disease in a cell, uh, from those who are about to die to those who are healthy and in between. Um, and it's also an opportunity, I think. To look at you know how the exposome ha is having its effects on the cell types of interest, whether they be enteric nerves or or nigral neurons, and um, there are also now ways um, to actually look at the 3D structure of the brain uh, and to see how that changes. Now this is 
All these things are tremendously large, complicated data sets, um, but it's now the problem 10 years ago was we couldn't get the data. And the problem now is we don't have a clue what to do with all the data. Uh, so, so the answer is really gonna require bringing heavy computational expertise into this uh, process. So initially at NIH, uh, we uh, recognize the complexity. Uh, most of the work has been in, as I mentioned, the gut biome and particularly in the environmental chemicals and toxins. Um, but going forward, we're going to stand up a new office for neural exposome science to work with NIHS, uh, focus on environmental neuroscience, bring all our neuroscientists kind of uh, at least familiar with what can be done and hopefully to get some really interesting cross-talk research done. Continue the chemical defense and the chemical safety work. Uh, just quickly, uh, the Counteract program has been really quite successful over the years and that's countermeasures against chemical threats run by David Jett and has really been our kind of foundational neurotoxicology at NINDS. Um, we're happy to work with NIHS on uh, funding this Comparatech Toxic Genomic Database. And we have some programs now. We work um, with funding from the Aging Institute on Alzheimer related dementias. And we have a call out now uh, for um, studies to look at the linkage between environmental toxicant exposures and Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's disease related dementias. We have a number of people uh, that we fund, uh, Dr. Kahi from Columbia, to look at radon exposure and stroke risk. And this is embedded in a study of 35,000 people called the REGARD study um, in the Southeast US. And also looking, uh, Dr. Sabiva, looking at gold. Gulf War illness and potential toxins there. Number of people looking at the brain gut axis in ALS actually. And there the trick was to look at, um, to look at animal genetic models of ALS and then to alter and study their microbiome. And they basically are able to identify certain bacteria in the gut that it were either protective or, um, or worsen the progression in that model and then you try and go and see if you can see that in patients as well. And that, that, that's still a little controversial whether that translates uh, into the patient work, but there are some, uh, some studies uh, suggesting it might. And, and then I think also we have to look together at all the other programs going around at NIH, uh, particularly the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Program looking over 10 years of kids from eight to 18 in terms of how they're how, they, how their brains and social behavior are developing over time and the, related to the exposures that they've been up against. Uh, it's heavily run by NIDA and they're mostly interested in drug exposures. We've been interested in exposure to uh, head injury, concussions in kids, um, but that's an opportunity to really look at some interesting outcomes in terms of development and I think it's 10,000 kids. Um, so, just to end up, I think uh, the problem, you know, I think the exposome is really the dark matter for NINDS. We need more purposeful engagement by the neuroscience to study this interaction with the environment. Uh, we need to work with teams from NIHS, the environmental experts, um, uh, and get state-of-the-art work going from both sides on these problems of neurologic disorders and trying to get to mechanisms, trying to get from, from association to causation. And, uh, and I think it's exciting work. I think it, it will, once we have the tools, uh, people will come. So uh, thanks very much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Walter, that was absolutely terrific. Um, so once again, Gary, would you mind coordinating the Q&A? Gary Ellison. Sure, yeah, I don't mind at all. Um, so as before, if you can use your reactions feature at the bottom of your screen and raise your hands, um, your virtual hand to ask questions. I see a thumbs up from Trevor. Do you have a question, Trevor? This is not a thumbs down. <laughs> questions, comments? 
So let's let people uh, warm up to this. Okay, take, here we go. So there, there uh, it's coming in. Okay, yep. Get ready, Walter. Here it comes. Uh, Bob and then Gary. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Hi, Walter. Um, just had a question. I'm, I'm a pediatrician, so um, I'm curious about what kind of work is being done uh, around the exposome in children, but also around early life environment and later life disease or DOHAD, developmental origins of health and disease. And a lot of environmental factors that happen to us as children predict what happens to us later in life. When I was in school, I once wrote a paper about childhood lead poisoning as a possible risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and why it was almost impossible to study. But um, what kind of work do you think should be done in that area? Well, I think, uh, I think that the, the real effort now is in um, these longitudinal studies of babies, of, I think it's BCD, is a, a study that's being run at NICHD, looking at infants, um, and uh, I think studying them until they're eight years old, and then the ABCD study comes in between eight and 18. Um, and clearly, uh, in the ECHO study as well, is looking at environmental influence on, on kids' development. Uh, but I think, you know, to get to the old age, you know, you really have, have to, you know, have good foundational data that's at the early age and then be able to follow things along. And so it sounds, you know, impossible, but in fact, I would say, you know, the atherosclerosis risk and community study, which was done by NHLBI, was started almost like 50 years ago to look at atherosclerosis. And now it's turned into just a bonanza for understanding the risk factors for dementia, just the population age. But I don't see any way of getting around that problem of just having good data and longer term follow up. Um, how to go backwards is tough. Um, you can go like in the regard study, what they'll do is they'll go back and look at, you know, the uh, zip code and the school zone you were in when you were growing up. And there are certainly associations there that they can pick up, but they, they're going to be tough to get to causality with that kind of data. You really need kind of detailed measurements. There actually is some interesting work being done with teeth that teeth yeah. encapsulate uh, chemicals at very early ages at NIH and funding. So there, I, there may be some yes. way. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it depends on what you can measure. But yeah, the teeth, you can get some stuff early on. Okay, Gary, and then Irva. So yeah, my question is kind of a derivative of what Karen asked me about cancer and this idea of the level of resolution. So in thinking about if you're studying susceptibility to Parkinson's or another neurodegenerative disorder, like how, how far do we have to drill down? Because we know that extravesicular vesicles transport information from the brain into the plasma we can get CSF. And is it possible that that systems level information is enough to help us understand vulnerability and that we don't need to do single cell work if we're trying to understand the environmental susceptibility? Like what, you know, how do we, how do we figure out how to get there? Yeah, well, I think so, you know, and I, people may think differently and there are different ways to think about this, but, uh, the good news about the neurologic disorder is not all of them, but they have a pathology. And so what you want to do is to nail down how the drivers give rise to the known pathology. And, and I think that um, it's actually more difficult than anyone could have imagined. And so I've been involved in a lot of failed studies where the epidemiologic data look like solid as a rock and the clinical trial showed nothing. So recently in Parkinson's, you know, we had data, really good data that high uric acid levels are protective in a population. Um, we had data from Parkinson's studies that showed people high uric acid at slower progression. So we did a trial of raising uric acid levels, but didn't see anything. Uh, we had, a, I was involved in the study of homocysteine 
uh, you know, homocysteine elevation and stroke, lots of great epidemiologic data. We did a trial with vitamins, we lowered homocysteine level, no effect on stroke. Uh, so when I mean, you could get lucky, you know, and, and jump from the epidemiology uh, to, you know, an intervention, but if you're interested in interventions, I mean, I think the, the lesson I've learned is just gotta kind of continue to tie the pieces together so there's a chain that you, that's just unbreakable, uh, which is never actually the case, but the more unbreakable it is, the more success you're gonna have when you go into intervention. Um, but that's, that's my opinion, so probably other ways. I mean, what do you think? I mean, you must- but I, I mean, I think it's, the idea is we wanna do studies where we, we approach that. Like, so if you can do, if you can, if you're looking at a, a brain pathway and you're doing imaging, but you can yeah. get CSF or plasma out of that same individual yeah. and maybe even get post-mortem, like you want to get that whole layer to see where yeah. do you see it, where does it break down? Yeah. Um, but that sort of like multi-scale project isn't always easily fundable in an RO1. Like, you know, it really takes a, a comprehensive sort of approach to do that uh, in, a, yeah. in a human population, at least. I mean, it's something... Yeah. The animal models you can do better, but it's yeah. so we have so we have an experiment there in Parkinson's, <clears throat> working with Michael J. Fox and multiple industry partners. We have a data center with uh, over ten thousand patients, CSF samples, blood samples, transcriptome, whole genome sequencing, proteomics, metabolomics to come, and so we are we are testing that. That's a, you know it's an uh, unique opportunity through the Accelerated Medicine Partnership to do that. It's called. PD AMP, uh, Parkinson's Disease Accelerated Medicine Partnership. Um, but that is an experiment that's up there now for people to explore. And we're, you know, we're looking for, you know, folks to do that and, and come up with these kind of networks that are going to be causal to the disease. Um, but those are, as you said, you know, that's, those are really expensive projects. $24 million, $30 million projects over five years. Um, that's what it takes to do that. And that's just one disease and I got 400 diseases. <laughs> thanks, Irva. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I, I, I'm very heartened um, that you're here and uh, I'm uh, thankful to Rick uh, for having reached out uh, to the other ICs and uh, in terms of, of this obvious need for collaborations across disciplines. Um, I, I've been working, uh, you know, I spent most, much of the last 20 years I've been working on autism and environmental factors. And uh, you know, one of the interesting uh, developments in that field has been this understanding of the maternal immune activation uh, in terms of neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, which seems like a, a really uh, a, an area ripe for this exposome uh, pathology, uh, pathophysiology mechanism right. and, um, and, and then behavioral outcomes. Uh, and I, I just, I thought I'd ask you what you, what you think of that, that particular area. Um, and yeah, I, I guess that's really the first question I had. I, it, it was very hard actually to, uh, to, um, to get funding for this kind of environment and, and uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. I mean, NIH has been supremely supportive, uh, but, but uh, there were many places where it seemed like uh, a linkage with NINDS uh, or NIMH and NICH and so forth could have could have helped the the, the field go a bit further than it was able to go. So, uh, yeah. so that that's kind of the the backstory <laughs> of, uh, of my question. Well, that backstory is not uncommon. I say oh, I told Dr. Collins once that we need an institute for what falls between the cracks of the different institutes. And I think that is the toughest problem in science funding at NIH, things that are in between. Um, but I think in terms of the immune interaction in, uh, in brain development, uh, I guess, you know, you may, may know that, you know, the, uh, it was almost completely unknown 
Uh, but within, you know, 10 years, maybe 15 years, it's pretty clear that the, the, the cells that are sculpting the connections between the, the neurons are the microglial cells. Uh, and so, um, so, the, so that's the innate immune system in the brain. And uh, the bone marrow induced immune system is, you know, equally important. <clears throat> but, you know, the brain pattern of development, you know, it has some genetic component to it. But then a lot of it is really based on interactions uh, between the different cell types. And uh, so if you knock out those immune systems, you don't, uh, you don't prune down and sculpt your nervous system. And in autism, uh, one of the features, Leith and the boys, is that, uh, that in young life, their brains are bigger because they're not doing that. And so the immune system seems to be really key. And, and, um, and it's not... You don't see uh, that in the GWAS study. You don't see a big immune component GWAS study. But if you look at brain tissue between autism and neurotypical development, the differences in the immune uh, uh, markers is gigantic. And it's different between males and females. So yeah, it's been, a, I think it's, it's really a key to autism. But, um, but how, to, how to intervene, nobody's, it really has a clue as to how to do that. Well, I do think the environmental component of, of inflammation is, is something that, uh, you know, has, has a lot of uh, evidence at this point in time. And, For sure. Uh, that, that, that's the environmental inflammatory. Um, and then the epigenetics is starting to really uh, come up as yeah. governing. And even, and even things like maternal stress. A light, you know, the mediators of maternal stress that are going to involve the field development as well. So yeah, it's a. It's a but you're right. The the interventions are not yet, not not yet clear. Right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? So we have about um, ten minutes left uh, for questions. Trevor has his thumb up again. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means. I hope, so, I'm, I hope I'm going to be more successful this time. I got oh, okay, great. There you are. Questions before. So, what a great presentation. You may recall I was on the National yes. Sciences Workshop on this yeah. very topic. And I'm really pleased that you and Rick were able to get together to actually come up with some really nice ideas about how to move this uh, field forward. So, so one particular exposure source you didn't comment on, which was raised at the National Academy, was actually the exposure for the olfactory bulb and the olfactory system mm -hmm. and air pollution and how that mm -hmm. might be related to the onset of neurodegenerative disease. Is there still going to be an interest in that aspect of the work? Oh, yes. Yes. I think, um, I, I, I mean, I basically just pick one example. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, I could have probably gone for and, but uh, the nose is the other area. Um, so I don't know if people know, but you know there are people. There are now drug companies that are trying to give drugs that will go into the nose and then go up the olfactory nerves into the brain. Um, if you inject manganese into the nose, it'll go right up the nerves, and you can. It'll go from one cell to another. You can track trace. So the, the, the nose, the nerves in the nose, the olfactory nerves going to the olfactory bulb is another real interesting entry zone uh, into the brain for any kind of a toxin. And it turns, and interestingly for Parkinson's, the olfactory bulb is frequently has synuclein in it, even to people who don't have any clinical Parkinson's disease. Um, so I think that that's, you know, the people have looked at the E. coli in the gut, uh, but I would imagine that looking at uh, bacteria in the nose would be equally uh, fruitful. And Alzheimer's is the other area. And so in Alzheimer's, it's a little bit trickier because you have two proteins that are aggregating. You have amyloid, which is extracellular, and you have tau, which is intracellular. But, th but um, tau, very much like synuclein, has been shown to spread from one neuron to another. 
uh, like a prion might spread. And so uh, that's all, you know, a theory of Alzheimer's is also um, that this is maybe occurring in the olfactory nerves working into the bulb. And then if people get symptoms from the bulb to the, uh, to the midbrain. Um, so that, those are the two competing entry zones in Parkinson's right now. And then, and then air pollution. So yeah, air pollution is, uh, uh, you know, clear, I think there's really good evidence um, that, it, that it influences um, risk of dementia on a population level. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, cardiovascular disease, I think even, even more clear. Um, so, so, so definitely important there. Um, now, do you have any thoughts on how, how to pursue that further? Well, I, I, think, I think to me, it's, it's part of um, the neuroinflammation story because uh, a PM2.5 right. contains LPS. Right. And that will spark an inflammatory response. And to right. know that these PM2.5 can get directly into the brain is very intriguing to me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I don't know if you saw, but that slide I showed you <coughs> the e -cur with the curly bodies, and then um, that study also shows that um, it caused inflammation in the brain. So there was, there was an IBA1 stain of microglia, which was exuberant in the animals who were, who were fed that E. coli with the curly body. So the aggregates and Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, those disorders are, there's a heavy immune component to, to them. And, and a lot of the drug companies now are kind of pushing on the immune aspects uh, and modulating those given the fact they've had so much trouble um, going after the amyloid hypothesis. But yeah, really good point. And actually the other story is a really funny story. Um, I think this is all true, but you know, you never know. <laughs> but uh, uh, David Haffler, who's an MS doc um, at Yale, had this idea that his patients with MS, you know, if they had really bad dietary habits, they had worse MS. And so he thought it was potentially related um, to eating at McDonald's. So he did these experiments where he fed in these models of EAE, experimental allergic encephalitis, <clears throat> he fed them McDonald's hamburgers. And sure enough, they had much worse EAE. So he said, oh, so now I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna just find out what the fats are. And so he basically broke out all the different fats in the hamburgers, fed them, and saw nothing. Um, and it turned out what it was, was the salt. It turns out that the salt activated a group of T-cells in the intestinal virus patches, and those T-cells went to the brain. Um, now, whether that's relevant to MS or not, you know, whether it's not entirely clear, but another investigator, Kazai de Kohler, got onto this and found out that feeding salt um, in his models, again, triggered this immune response, but that led to tau aggregation in neurons through a nitric oxide mediated mechanism. So you know, how those are gonna pass, not entirely clear, um, but, uh, but just so surprising, uh, an area of science that people you know, neglected you know, for decades is now coming back to bite us in a sense. Um, so the salt story in the gut, another really interesting one. So, so oh, you know, of all the exposome features, every exposome factor is gonna be another interesting story like that. So the other comment I had was autism spectrum disorder. In, yeah. the, in the sense that, uh, as we've heard in this uh, Q and A session, yeah. there is a preponderance of uh, ASD in boys versus girls. I think the ratio is about yeah. four, to, four to one. Right. It does raise the issue in my mind about whether or not there's issues related to epigenetics here and imprinted genes. So uh, obviously, environmental exposures can affect uh, imprinted gene expression. So yeah. I'm wondering if there's a story there. 
that's worth going after. Yeah, well, the story, as I mentioned before, was that, at least this is the explanation, I understand it, is that the, uh, the immune response in the brain for the genetic load that will cause autism in boys is not present in girls. So for the same genetic load, you don't see autism in girls because the immune response is significantly less. So you have to jump the genetic load in, in girls to see autism. So I, that is, is my understanding of the current state. Now, now you know, what the, what the underlying principles of those differences are, I don't know myself, although I would say in, in almost all the research that we do, what we've been finding is dramatic differences in stroke and multiple sclerosis, you name it, uh, in the immune response in women versus men. Great. Thank you so much, Water. Yeah, Trevor, thank you. Thank you, Walter. I, I think we're at time. So Rick, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, sounds good. Walter, will you have a few more minutes? You can join us for an open discussion. Sure, happy to. Okay, terrific, great. Well, let me turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Bennett, Michelle. Okay, Michelle is there. And so, yeah, Michelle, I, I know that you've got a few questions or you wanna tee up some of the, the conversations. So Walter and Gary together, have uh, brought up a number of, of different important things. So Walter clearly is, is very interested in better understanding how, to, how can we bring these exposome concepts to bear on helping them understand the environmental perturbations that are influencing neurological disorders. And Gary's got a model around how do we collect some of that data. Uh, but what's clear from some of the discussions here is we've got to do a lot of work about data management and pulling together resources from a number of different places. So, Michelle, let me turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Rick. And, and thanks again to Gary and Walter for a really spectacular presentations. I found them incredibly informative and I think they tee up this, this discussion session really, really well. Um, I just feel very privileged to be able to do this today to facilitate the discussion. Um, I am not planning to speak very long, but I did wanna just take a couple of minutes to set the stage. Um, I think in large part, um, you don't want to hear me talking, we want to hear you talking so that you can help us here at NIEHS think about what some of the next steps are in the exposome. So I just want to let folks know that the, the purpose of today's discussion is to explore with the board and to begin exploring and initiating conversations with the environmental health science community how we can share more effectively and convey more convincingly the power of environmental exposure research to, in health and to disease. And I think you heard a lot of that today. Um, what can we do to leverage cohorts or biospecimens already being studied and invested in by others? What approaches can we take to non-NIEHS ICs to help them learn how to collect information on exposures, for example, um, is there an exposome framework that we can develop? Is there a toolkit that we can develop and offer to folks who haven't yet thought about this or who aren't sure about how to integrate um, exposome research into their, their approaches? Um, and I think we just heard Walter say, tools, tools. When we have the tools, people will come. And so what are some of the tools that we, we do need to build or, or make available? Um, Gary presented a great framework. I think, Walter, it was wonderful to hear how you're integrating environment into neuroscience. And I think one of the things that, you know, perhaps we could figure out is, you know, what can we learn from what NINDS has done and is doing, uh, especially in the context of this interdisciplinary and based what I've heard um, today, you know, really transdisciplinary research. Um, I've put together a few questions. Um, if you think the questions are great, you can credit um, Bob Wright, Gary Miller, David Balshaw, and Rick Wojcik for giving me some input. If you think the questions, I missed the mark, you can blame it all on me. That will be fine. Um, so we'll get those up on the screen so that you can see them and then open up the floor for some reaction and input. Um, as we've been doing all along, if you have something you want to say, feel free to put your, um, your hand up using the, the reactions function. 
and um, or if that's not working for some reason, wave your hand or just jump in and let me know that you'd like to be added to the queue. Um, and again, you know, the focus of this is really to get a dialogue going and to figure out how NIEHS can really catalyze exposome research more broadly um, across many diseases and many areas of, of even just health research. So um, I think Rick kind of gave a, a little bit of a charge ahead of time. And so here are some of the questions. And I see Terrence has his hand up already. So Terrence, we'll, we'll let you get us started. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. And uh, thanks, uh, Gary and Walter, for wonderful uh, presentations and stimulating this, this uh, discussion. Um, one of the things that I think um, might be important for the Institute to consider uh, is the role of study sections in funding unconventional uh, cross-disciplinary research. It's often the case that novel uh, proposals and hypotheses don't fare very well under our um, existing structures uh, in review. So I'm wondering if um, the institutes have in mind uh, RFAs that have special emphasis panels that might actually help to bridge this gap. So I think that's an amazing question. Um, I don't know if um, Rick or Walter or Gary or Pat, you've heard of anything at the review level? Yeah, Walter, I see that you've unmuted. Did you want to uh, start the, the response of this? Um, <clears throat> well, I'll be interested to see what Rick has to say. I think, uh, you know, as I put on my first slide, we're, we're looking for, you know, in general, my philosophy is to try to not be top down as much as possible and rely on the really smart people out there to submit grants. And that being said, we also look for gap areas and clearly this is a gap area. And, and sometimes for a gap area, you have to you do have to do things that are more top down. Sometimes it's convening groups and getting you know, collaborations to go. Sometimes it's RFAs. Um, and, you know, I would, the only thing I'd say as an institute director, um, I talk to groups, you know, a couple of times a week and everybody wants an RFA. So, so there are limits. Um, the best thing is if, um, if, we, if we can get the science to drive the research. Uh, but I think, Things like that are important to get things started when it looks like there's a really you know, good chance it's gonna start opening some doors that are then sustainable over time. So the RFAs are, you know, they're basically you know, a, little, a little match to try and light a fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Walter, I think that was very well said. Uh, so I guess my response, Terry, would be that I think we know what we want to try to achieve which is getting more of this cross-disciplinary collaborative um, research happening. And if the current mechanisms to accommodate to that are not there, then I think that's part of what Walter and I have to do is put our heads together and uh, see if there are some ways of letting that match. I guess I like that analogy. Uh, so let's light the match and see if we can um, actually ignite maybe the fuse for that uh, piece of dynamite to kind of explode some collaborative, collaborative efforts and get some things going. So again, I, I, you know, keeping it focused on what's the type of science that we want to see happen and then uh, not letting some of the, you know, the current impediments in the way that study sections evaluate grants, you know, getting in the way to you know, ultimately achieving that end result. So Terry, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. So what other thoughts do folks have out there? Um, you've heard two very stimulating uh, talks. Um, Trevor, I think your thumb is up. Is there something you'd like to add? Yes, uh, I wanna come back to the concept of tools versus research. So um, uh, Gary gave us a great presentation on the sophistication of instrumentation he has available to him, uh, GCMS, uh, high resolution mass spectrometry uh, uh, and the informatics component to it as well. 
not all of this is available at every institution uh, for people to follow that paradigm in terms of exposed own research. And uh, we do have this uh, resource called the Human Exposure Assessment Resource, the HERE resource, which is across NIH. And you wonder whether or not if rather than everyone trying to develop their own sophisticated instrumentation platform, whether or not some kind of here structure might be appropriate in terms of one set of tools. However, another set of tools that should be considered is, is that whether you go with a here laboratory format or actually uh, promote research at each individual institution with sophisticated instrumentation, at the end of the day, the price tag is very, very high on this approach. And it makes you wonder whether or not we can get there using cheaper methods. And so I'm really be interested in seeing some research really validating biosensors that might be able to capture individual exposures as a, as a different paradigm to think about capturing uh, the exposome. And also Gary did talk about the use of GIS uh, uh, information platforms. So another way to capture the exposome or complementary would be to the use of biosensors and GIS information, which might be more palatable in terms of the price tag. Thank you, Trevor. I see that Irva has put her hand up. Irva, did you have a question or a comment? It's a, it's a, Rick, um, Robin right, posted ahead. something in the chat um, ahead, in Gary. response to Trevor. Um, she asked a question like a BGI model, Trevor. I think Gary knows what I mean by that comment. The idea of having a uh, massive um, scaled effort that, that can do um, this type of analysis at, at a national level. And I'm just curious Robin, your thoughts. I'm not sure, are you talking about the, uh, the Beijing Genome Institute? Yes, I am. It's okay, the, it. the massive instrumentation with lots of um, uh, support that makes that resource more affordable for the masses. Trevor, did you wanna respond to that? So I think that's what, I, I, what I'm trying to promote here is, is thinking about this in multiple different ways, because we are gonna have this barrier to address uh, in terms of availability of this kind of, in, of this platform for, for the researcher. And I think at the end of the day, what we're interested in is improving public health. And so we need to know whether or not the sophisticated instrumentation that we have with uh, GCMS and, and higher resolution liquid chromatography mass spectrometry is going to get us there versus, say, a biosensor approach. And maybe you need both. Uh, I, I'm, I'm agnostic on this, but I think that we do need to start comparing different ways to get exposomic data to determine whether or not it's going to give us the deliverable that's going to improve public health. Thank you, Trevor. It sounds like you're really encouraging the community, maybe NIEHS as well, to really think about tools and what the next generation of tools might look like. That's Irva, I think, oh, I'm sorry. That's yeah? correct. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Irva, you have your hand up? Yes, I do. And actually, I think my comment uh, builds a little bit on what Trevor is talking about and also some of the other themes of uh, earlier um, in, in the previous uh, couple of presentations, which is that, um, yes, a lot of work actually is already being done with uh, biosensors and um, and personal monitoring that it, that can and already is beginning to make these links between the corresponding biological responses and the exposome itself. Um, we're, we've been working with um, uh, Christina Davis, an engineer here at UC Davis, um, who has been working on well, at least three or four devices that I, I know about and many others. Uh, one of the ones that she has, for example, <clears throat> is a breath sampler and it's a, a fairly easy to use uh, sampler and the breath, uh, exhaled breath condensate. Uh, she has uh, run it through 
um, through Mass Spec and uh, and has has gotten some uh, really in, in quite strong readouts for both um, uh, metabolomics um, endogenous chemicals as well as environmental chemicals um, using the same samples essentially. Um, and then that paired with some other devices like small wearable air um, uh, air, field, air monitors that um, are, are able to collect both particle and um, some gas phase um, uh, material to analyze and link to spatial coordinates you know, with GIS as well. Um, and, you know, linking to the <clears throat> new funding on climate change, <clears throat> Uh, one, one of the big challenges for understanding what's going on with the wildfires in, in the western part of the U.S. right now is really characterizing what is the exposure that people are experiencing and experiencing for extended periods of time during our, you know, three to four month smoke season um, annually. And, uh, you know, I, I think that this really, you know, my, my opinion is that this really um, does require these kinds of longitudinal uh, measurements um, in real time uh, that are spatially referenced um, and being able to link those to both biological markers through sensors and other means, as well as the health outcome. And that, that's, that, that's going to be really critical to understanding, you know, how to treat the patients who are coming into the ER or are experiencing long-term mental health uh, impacts and uh, and really understanding the relationship of the mental and and um, and uh, respiratory and other other uh, other effects, immune effects and, as well. So uh, you know, I I think we're the technology is here and uh, obviously still needs lots more development um, to make everything uh, really scalable and um, uh, cheap enough. Uh, but there's a there's just a lot that's happening that does link, and I know Gary, you focus a lot more on the 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 more um, molecular aspects, um, and but referred repeatedly to the um, the GIS and geospatial kind of data that needs to go with it, and I and I think I think that is the future, and it's going to help us in, in lots of problems. I, you know, I've been thinking a lot <laughs> lately about about our wildfires, but um, with with many types of disasters all over the country, I think, and and different kinds of exposures, but also some common types of exposures in in these uh, varying types of disasters. I think uh, th this is an area that's really ripe for um, for further work. Thank you, Irva. It, you know, really, I think one of the a couple of takeaways from what you said really has to do also with scalability and and cost and how do we really put these tools in the hands of people to to use them. I think that comment's been made by others as well. So thanks for reinforcing that. Um, Terrence, your hand is up. Is it still up or is it up again? Sorry, I, I left oh. it up, but uh, I, I could actually ask a follow-up question. Okay. Um, so I, I'm wondering, um, um, Gary, when, when you talk about um, some of the uh, metabolomics that might be spatially oriented, so for instance, uh, in the context of something like a Maldi, Maldi TOF, imaging for um, for uh, key uh, metabolites. To what extent have people been talking about integrating that kind of technology together with single cell transcriptomics or epigenomics? My, my thinking around that space has really been more in my simple models, like within something like C. elegans, where we can control that single cell effect in multiple ways. Uh, so I, I, I just like, I think like getting to the human samples, it, technologically it's, it's quite feasible it's just not something that I've tried to tackle yet. I've been thinking about it more in simple or, you know, cellular systems like that. But, but knowing that that technology is there, you know, allows you to pose that question. Like if we saw this at a, you know, whole body scale, we could go down and drill down to that lower level of the organ to the cellular level. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a newer area, but I think it's an area that 
can complement the, the single cell RNA seq type of work um, that you really needed to kind of complement it to get the functional and the, the more environmental potential influencers. Thanks, Gary. Hey, Bob, you have your hand up. Good to see you, Michelle. Um, I have a question that's more for uh, Walter and Rick, and I think it's human nature to sort of try to move three steps too fast. And I think there's a lot of foundational work that still needs to be done in exposomics, uh, particularly in bioinformatics and development of databases. And even, even though it's going to meet some resistance requirements for data sharing, uh, creating some sort of websites like an online Mendelian inheritance and in man, which actually explain the biological, known biological effects of chemicals, particularly as they get identified. But even when they're in their pre-identification state, we usually know something about them, like their molecular formula, their molecular weight. And that's a big bioinformatics investment. Is there any discussion about NIH doing that? maybe institute and center wide, because I think that sort of foundational work is really going to be needed if exposomics is to be brought into a larger research community. Rick or Walter, would you like to take that? Yeah, I, I'm happy to chime in here. Walter, do you want to make a comment first or do you want me to go just first? Say, I would say comment fun. <laughs> what do you think? Well, well it, it, absolutely. I mean, Sounds like the comment fun. There, there may be definitely a role for the common fund. I guess what, and Bob, you are absolutely spot on on this. So I, I guess my response is that what we need as, as a community, the broad-based biomedical community is come up with a plan. I mean, what are the things that actually need to be addressed like today? And then are there technology development things? So, so you know, Gary is articulating you know, really well, what are the things we need to collect? But some of the technologies uh, to collect them may exist, but they, they may not be broadly disseminated. Um, and there may be other technologies, especially around individual, or individual exposures that don't exist yet. But if we as a community agree that those are really important things that we need to develop a technology for, then that could potentially be a, um, an opportunity to go to the Common Fund. So it could be with Walter or with other IC directors uh, and I suspect that many of the types of environmental exposures that would be in interesting to Walter may be interested to Ned Sharpless, may be interested to uh, Josh Gordon and a whole variety of other ICs across the NIH. So we, we need to develop that plan. So what is it, what do we need to collect? When do we need to collect it? But keeping in mind as well, Bob, because I know you know that we need to have the, the data framework to be able to collect these things so that we can seamlessly integrate this together into a central repository that we can draw from. So we need to have those, those plans in place. And that, that's part of the reason why we're having this uh, presentation and discussions today. So hopefully we can leave today's meeting where we can get some heads, uh, you know, some people, uh, I guess, joining around the virtual table here, at least in the near term, and see if we can start piecing together exactly what it is that we need to be doing and what do we do differently? So we can take the concept of the exposome, just like the, uh, the concept of the genome. You know, it started off as a, a very broad kind of a concept. And then um, you know, back in the days when the genome was originally proposed, I don't think anyone knew what type of technology would ultimately emerge as the, the best way to actually get the job done. But it started off with a plan and it started out with a vision. So let's uh, develop that, uh, that broad-based vision, you know, try to define some of the components that we need to collect data around, and then put a framework in place that uh, you know, Walter and I and Josh and others and Ned can actually go to the Comet Fund and see if we can develop some new technologies to help get the job done. I don't know, Walter, is, uh, how does that strike you? Yeah, I think, you know, from the Institute's point of view, if you think about it, um, you know, things, things bubbled up seemingly out of serendipity. It was not, wasn't like we had all the exposomes for every Parkinson's patient all mapped out and we picked the best one. We basically had uric acid, you know, measurements and that popped up. And so we pursued it uh, and spent, you know, millions of dollars on it. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's a, 
it's not it's not been a rational logical progression of collecting the exposome data and then you know by by informatics looking at what are the most significant drivers it's been much more serendipity or it's been big effect sizes you know like lead for instance um that uh you know would just would, would just like staring us in the face um i think that you know now, from talking to you know what's been said today, you know the one problem is the exposome is everything. So, at some level, you know we have to take a shot at you know at defining what part of it we're going after and hoping we're going to be lucky. Um, and then for the neurologic diseases, it's really trying to look for big effect sizes and smaller groups of people who are defined by X, Y, or Z. So you could say in Parkinson's disease, we're gonna be able to tell you in the next five years, whether you have the synucleinopathy based on a skin biopsy or a spinal fluid test. No question, we can do that. So that's gonna be an at-risk group. So you'd like to know of those people, some of them will go on to symptomatic Parkinson's Others will have some synuclein in the olfactory bulb and be fine. But that's the population you want to concentrate on and understand what are the drivers that move people into a symptomatic versus continuing an asymptomatic state. So the, the exposome then, in my mind, would, you would focus on that, you know, that question, bring it to bear on that question. The more you have, the more you have to look at, the more chance you're going to find it. But that being said, I don't. I think the percent of the exposure we're going to be able to measure is is still going to be a tiny percent. So we have to somehow negotiate, you know, how do we pick that percent that we're going to measure, and 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 judge that wisely. Thanks, Rick and Walter. Just, just keeping in mind that there may be ep epigenetic signatures. Yes. Uh, that are relevant to different types of exposures, and there may be epigenetic signatures that are common to multiple different types of exposures. But you know, keeping keeping that in mind as well. And I, I know so you can that, right. So you can that. work backwards. So that's the other point. You can work from the patients, look at look at their tissues, find a signature in the patients, and then see can can certain environmental exposures drive that signature. That's another way right. of going back translating. Jalone, I think you had your hand up next, and then Gary after that. Yeah, um, thanks so much. So I, I guess I'm I am going to take it maybe a little bit kind of practical, and and so hopefully this question makes sense. But I've been working with a lot of communities that are uh, that are dealing with flooding and the impacts of flooding, both short and long term health effects, particularly related to mold. And the fact that mold is, is something that is, you know, kind of unregulated and many low income communities and communities of color, um, you know, don't have kind of like the, the resources or, or sometimes even the education to know what is the proper level of remediation uh, and oftentimes returning to their homes and being exposed and dealing with all these ramifications. And so when I think about this concept of the exposome, and I think in one of the definitions you offered, uh, Dr. Miller, in terms of like the cumulative impacts, and um, I think about health and climate and the cumulative impacts of flooding and the trauma and all these different things. I guess I was just wondering, is there one, like a, a tool or something that can be developed to using this concept to help with like these everyday disasters that um, impact people in many ways? And I'm just thinking about flooding and again, this mold exposure. So that's one thing. And then the, the second question is really around, you know, this concept, can you use this exposome concept to really kind of define what is a safe, I don't even want to say safe level of exposure, but what is the, the level of exposure that people should be able to return to their homes? Because again, I'm seeing this across the country um, and it's, it's really, it, it's becoming a huge public health issue. And yeah, I'm just, curious if if that has come into the conversation and, and what are your thoughts on kind of using this concept to one maybe define a level of safety 
um, in terms of mold exposure, particularly, and then what tools maybe could be developed from this. If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Jill, Jalone. Rick or Gary um, Ellison, did you wanna respond to that? I think I'm gonna ask Gary, Gary Miller. Uh, Gary you, Miller. I suspect that uh, that might be something you're, uh, you're ready to respond to. I, you know, I can take a crack at that. I mean, I, I think we, we first have to, getting back to this idea of like, what is a reference exposome? What is the sort of normal range is we, we need to have that information. And then we can look for deviations from that. So for example, like we can detect many mycotoxins, which would be very good signatures of a mold exposure, but we have to know what the normal part is and when people in that population, when their levels return to that certain level. So I, I think those things are feasible once you have that sort of reference exposome within a given population and an approach how to do it. So you might say with what happened like in a hurricane in a certain area, you may not be able to use the national reference exposome, but you could quickly go in and do one on that existing population and monitor it and I think this is one of the, the challenges is that we, to me, if you're looking under the street lamp, you're not doing the exposome. You have to be looking for the unknowns. Again, like the idea that you may have some mold metabolite we've never seen before that would pop up on mass spec, but if you're only looking for the knowns, you'd never see it. And, and I think that's a critical piece of the exposome is you have to have this discovery untargeted approach as part of it or you will lose that opportunity for discovery. And it, so while, since I have the mic, the, the other comment I wanted to make about some of these approaches and potential common fund is if you think about like this ARPA health thing is that if you could systematically evaluate the relative environmental contribution to all human disease, that seems ARPA-like to me. Like if we could come up with those key tools we'd have to have that would be the sort of grand experiment that could systematically study and then intervene because you would have this information. So that, that would be like, I, I think that there, we need to have the environment more involved with this. And even for example, in the sort of like all of us scale, while it's not the ideally planned study from a design, we know that the first investment was to do sequencing of all those samples as they come in. Why can't we have the environmental complement also on the table that we're ready to do it, whatever we decide that it is. But right now it's like, we're still with lack of an NIH version of the definition of it. We, we don't know how to explain it to other people. So Gary, I think I hear you saying two different things. And I think one of them is, is that we need a definition. We need a way, a common way to, a common way to talk about this across maybe not just the NIH, but the community in general. Um, did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, my, my view is that we really need an NIH biomedical definition because it, while there's a, a value for more environmental, eco, EPA things, is that this is an NIH conversation. In the NIH framework, we need a definition that's very focused on what NIH does. And in some ways, like if we try to please everybody, we won't actually make progress. And so I think we need to have this operational definition that gets us to where we wanna be in a few years. And if it's saying, like, if we need a, a definition for the common fund project, we could have one for that. And then we could have one for all of us. And then we could have one for other projects, but we, we need to start with a definable version of it that can actually be pursued and have technology around it to develop it. That's great. And, and the other thing I think I hear you saying is that, and I think you used all of us as the example, you know, first things they first thing they did is they sequenced genomes, right? And so what's the exposome equivalent? So can you make a comment on, you know, would you see that a first step in that would be to take some subset of tools that we know we have that do a pretty good job and just get started? Or how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so fortunately, I've been asked to be on the All of Us Research Program Advisory Board, so I have a chance to, to insert these ideas. And, and I've talked to the people that run the biobank at the Mayo Clinic for all of us. And 
and we've run samples from the Mayo Biobank, is that I, I believe that if you had the geocoded information and you could use the high resolution mass spec on those biobank plasma samples, that is a tractable thing. We could pursue that. It won't give us everything, but it will give us a lot more information on the environment than we currently have. And, and those are things that they're, they're feasible. I mean, it's information. We'd have to draw it, the budgets and things, but I, I think we need to position. I mean, we're still a couple years away from having a million people enrolled, but in two or three years, it'd be nice to say, we're ready to do the exposure on 200,000. Great, thanks, Gary. Edith, I think you are next and then Karen. Uh, yeah, Gary, so thanks. This has been a great uh, presentation, uh, both speakers, but so coming from more of a social science aspect of, of, of bringing into this, thinking about what we know about social determinants that could certainly impact the exposome by making you more at risk for exposures to you know, uh, certain chemicals if you're in an EJ community, et cetera. But I'm wondering about how, to, how the, you handle the sort of direct impact of um, say racism or you know, chronic stressors, et cetera. And is that sort of picked up in terms of changes in biological processes and how you map it back? Or are we still just trying to, to figure that out? Um, and it, and let me also offer up, it may be like you just said, we need to figure out where we're starting and this may, may make it too, too big, but. Yeah, I mean, it's right. Like the, I, I'm not a sociologist and I don't really work in this space. Um, and I, I don't think we always, we can't molecularize every process. And I, I'm gonna be careful of that. But, you know, for example, if you think about a chronic stress situation and we think about a relatively, crude measure of allostatic load, right? This idea of the wear and tear. You can't tell me there's not a molecular signature of allostatic load. And, and you could say, it's like if we had environmental data that showed which things were altering those sorts of metrics, we could have a high resolution mass spec version of that where you could make those connections. And I think that's where having the different communities and where you've seen interventions, if you have the right independent variables, you would be able to see what corrective action does. And, and I, I believe you would see this in sort of a change in the network biology of the systems that are involved in responding to stress. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. I'm just curious if there's anyone else out there who, who's interested in responding to that question as well. well I just say that there's a, a lot of, you know, systems neuroscience Work that's going on looking at these kind of issues in animal systems for sure. There's quite a bit known. Thanks, Walter. Karen? Yeah, this may be a continuation of uh, Gary's response to the last question. So I'm looking more from the molecular side. So we can do a lot of data gathering. So I, I'm thinking about where NIH or NIEHS wants to invest funds, right? So we know that that's always a limitation. <laughs> and when we're thinking about gathering data, omics, whatever type of data, large data sets, like was mentioned previously, you know, that requires a lot of um, foundational work up front, bioinformatics, how to, how to obtain the data, and but really then what to do with the data. So where, I guess maybe that, that follows the question, when should it, exposome research be integrated into research studies. So maybe more looking at that, like we've been talking from one extreme to the other, the large data sets down to a single, from large groups down to a single cell, and how do we utilize that information? And I wonder, so then would, are we thinking like RFAs for R01s for, you know, right? Rather than, um, I mean, in addition to investing in data collection, right? I just wondered if maybe Rick or, I, I don't know, would like to respond to that. Rick, do you have a thought you'd like to share? Well, so, so my thought is, let's see here. Okay, okay there we are. So my, my thought is to, and I, I have to apologize, I just had a, a, an a email crash. So I was momentarily talking with <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the help uh, team in Bethesda. Um, but I, I think I caught, so let me return to, I think, some of the comments that Gary was making. 
which is, I think we need to start with a framework of, you know, what is the exposome, okay? And what are the things we want to collect? And I think we have to be very careful because we can't collect everything all at once. So what are the types of things that we could collect? I mean, some of the geospatial data, it's out there. It's just that we're not uh, at the point where we include you know, these, these types of data um, when we do experiments for you know, whole genome sequence analysis. So developing that framework, deciding what it is we're gonna start collecting. And then uh, as we start collecting it, we can always add additional things. Uh, to the data, data that we collect. So again, looking back at the genome project, we started off with a, a, a big, bold uh, vision. And you know, it started off with you know, the, remember the STSs, the sequence tag sites. Um, so there wasn't any nucleotide sequencing going on, but it was mapping different chromosomes and mapping different regions of the genome. Maybe that's where we are with the exposome project right now. So we're just collecting STS equivalents. But as we become more sophisticated, as we uh, develop you know, personal monitors and we can collect more of the totality of exposure, you know, we develop a data framework where we can accommodate um, the, this type of data. So Karen, does that actually address your question? So sorry if I- um, Well, let me, okay, let me rephrase. Let me ask another question then I rephrase it. So, yeah. um, okay, so what to collect is extremely important to making the framework. We may not know 10 years down the road, something we collected may become extremely useful in a way we never expected. I get that. But from the NIEHS perspective or NIH perspective, um, we're thinking about what to collect, but are we thinking about how to use what we collect? So, I mean, of course that goes into what we collect, but I mean, thinking like financially. So are we then putting in a lot of money to, uh, to, uh, to collect the data, to obtain it? Are, there, are we then going on the other side of that, which is, you know, putting out RFAs for individual R01s to study sort of the molecular level using those data sets at what's, what, what's the next best way to approach this from a mechanism of action standpoint for drug development, something like that. I guess that's my question. So we're doing that for Parkinson's. As I mentioned for Parkinson's, we did, because it's an accelerated medicine partnership, half the money comes from industry, half comes from us. We decided to go with it. And so we have a tremendous data collection. Uh, and we put out RFAs for people to analyze that data. Uh, and actually, you know, so the interesting thing is that, you know, at the, you know, the industry puts in the money and now we're talking to them about going to next step. And it, the interesting thing was they, um, they were all gung-ho about collecting this giant database. And now they're saying, we're not gonna put any more money in until somebody proves to me that there was something in there value. So right. there right. is this, there is, you have to be a little careful about you know, collecting data for the sake of collecting data, mainly because of the expense. Um, you know, if you can do it cheaply, the more the better, but. It's uh, incredibly expensive. And then you run into this problem of sustainability because once you've collected it, what's it going to cost to run it? So the, our database was built by Verily Corporation, an offshoot of Google. Um, so it's pretty sophisticated, but it, it, would, it would be a million dollars a year just for maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, thank you for that. that that's, so, so Rick, that's sort of what I was looking at from NIEHS perspective, if that's what your intentions are as well, because I think that's a great way to, you know, think about how to utilize data and funding to get the best out of the data. Yeah, I guess, uh, Karen, the, I return to the, you know, the, the, you know, the fundamental concept of developing a framework is what is it we want to do? I mean, what ultimately do we want to achieve? And then what are the types of, of exposure data that if we collect, you know, gets beyond just one pesticide or one exposure at a time, mm -hmm. you know, developing that framework um, and thinking very carefully about that, what's the best way to approach this. Um, mm -hmm. you know, is there, for example, a set of epigenetic marks that may reflect uh, a variety of different types of exposures, um, kind of getting at what Garrett was talking about in the end, you know, when you start changing how genes are being expressed and you change the, and change the internal biology um, as a consequence of an environmental exposure, uh, you know, that's ultimately where, where you, you, want to, you want to understand those biological processes. So developing a framework, and then, you know, once you have the framework in place, then you have to ask, well, you know, Jay, 
uh, how much is this going to cost and <laughs> what is it going to take? And so the exposome is, is really complicated. I mean, it's, it's so much more complicated than the genome. C's, T's, A's, and G's, you know, 6 billion uh, C's, T's, A's, and G's was complicated. But now if you're talking about uh, all sorts of different environmental exposures, we've got to think about what's the smartest way to do this in a sustainable way. And then I think there's also a very important component here, which is to be integrating the exposome data with the genetics and genomics data. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I, you know, and Gary's heard me talk about this before, we shouldn't be working in parallel. Um, we need to be intersecting with the genetics and the genomics folks. So we don't have to resequence the genome because there may be genetic contributions to some of the differential responses that individuals have to a given environmental exposure. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, again, I guess just returning to the concept, what, what's the framework? What do we collect? When do we collect it? And then uh, trying to figure out, okay, what is the data infrastructure that we need that is, has hopefully a, a th you know, thoughtfully put together so that it's expandable as we increase the amount of data that we collect. And then I'm, I'm a, also a big fan. I mean, could we go to the common fund as a way of kind of nucleating some of the funding uh, that can you know, get some of this going? It's, a big, it's gonna be a big project. Uh, but I'm also a fan of the possibility of you know, once we have a convincing framework and an argument that if we collect this type of data, it's going to be uh, pretty transformational to the way that we understand the etiology of human disease. Uh, you know, potentially going forward with an ARPA-like, an ARPA-H-like project or a public-private partnership in collaboration mm -hmm. with ARPA-H. Mm -hmm. So there, I mean, there are lots of possibilities, but it all it, it has to start with a very thoughtful. Uh, framework of what is it we want to be doing? Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that does. It goes, yes. So thinking maybe okay. putting that in context with what people are already studying where they could utilize the data right away, something like that. Yeah, that's what it, that, yeah, thank you. Well, well that's also that's another great example is that there's all kinds of this geospatial data that's being collected. And, and we have to be very thoughtful about how do we integrate that into the way that you evaluate environmental exposures. So you want to evaluate air pollution, and you have all of this data. And it's just simply a matter of now potentially develop uh, the, I, I referred to some of the, the integrated data repositories where we bring the uh, geospatial data together with the environmental exposure data together with genetics and genomics you know, what, what are the necessary data uh, uh, frameworks that we really need to pull all this together? Right. Yeah, and I'm thinking Thank about you. this, Thank Karen, you. I just say that, you know, thinking about this question that you pose is what, what would you want? I mean, I, you know, I, I may not have the right answer, but the reason why I talk so much about the interface between the environment and the uh, nervous system is because that's where I would put my money. Um, that, you know, that's, that's where these two areas come together. And, and to focus on that seems to be, you know, at least, at least from what we've seen looks, looks like it's going to be fruitful. Mm -hmm. That interface, what gets mm -hmm. across that interface? How does it get across? What cells is what cells are picking things up, and what is the pathology that follows? Um, that's 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 you know that's not everything. That is well, it's a lot, but it's it's focused on the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Thanks for all those the, that input and comments. Terrific, um, David Belshaw, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, another answer to to Karen. Um, so. We also, um, we talked a little bit about here earlier as, as kind of part of NIEHS's effort to implement the exposome across our portfolio uh, in partnership with some other ICs. And you'll hear from, from Matt tomorrow on the partnership with ECHO through, through here as well. But when we established here and, and the, the earlier CHEER program, you know, this, this idea of data sharing and data reuse was really kind of key to our thinking because while it's a, benefit to the individual projects that are utilizing the resource. The true value comes from that effort to come back in and, and mine that uh, data. So we have a public access repository that's being populated with all of the data that we're collecting linked with the phenotypic data 
that is coming from those studies. Like Gary was saying, um, you know, we're, we're, we're adding exposure onto existing studies, building out the, the, the breadth of the exposed zone. And in the concept for here that, that we, we pushed, um, there is an idea of doing some solicitation and, and, and supporting research to come back in and, and do secondary analysis and mining of, of that data. And it's really a, a, a comprehensive matrix that looks at targeted exposure assessment, so very much similar to what CDC is doing with NHANES, the untargeted assessment, uh, and the outcome data across multiple exposures and multiple disease endpoints. So, so you really have this, this you know, kind of unprecedented um, you know, ability to come in with some, some high-end data science tools and ask some you know, really provoking questions with that resource uh, as it's populated. Thanks, David. Thanks for chiming in there. Um, so I just want to kind of recap, I think, a couple of the things that I've heard so far um, and see what other thoughts and ideas people have. Um, definitely Michelle, have, excuse yes. me, but before yeah, yeah. you do that, um, can we stop sharing the screen oh. so that we can all see each other? Absolutely, that's fine. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, so I think one of the things that I've heard people really talk about is a, a dire need for an NIH definition for the exposome. Um, and then once there's a definition, it sounds like we could work to create a framework um, to really think about how to do this in a really smart, I think Rick said, a smart, smart sustainable way. Um, you know, and then that can cascade to resources. You've talked about tools, smaller, cheaper, better. How can we do this? How can we bring down the scale of the, the costs? Um, almost makes me think of the discussions that we had a decade or so ago about the cost to sequence one human genome, right? And it was an awful lot of money. And we've really brought that down over the last decade. I think maybe we can start thinking about things that we could do in this area. Um, this, a central here-like um, resource is something like that possible since not everybody's potentially going to be able to duplicate this in um, their, their institutions. Data, 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 data. Um, somebody made the comment that, you know, initially, um, you know, where are we going to get the data? I think it was you, Walter, and now you're, you're flooded with data and there's so much data, how do you manage it all? And so I think that is something that we need to be mindful of. Um, and then a few comments about the potential of something like a common fund. And um, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of really fantastic conversation around what might be possible, especially from us here at the NIEHS and the NIH to, to think about in terms of um, what we could um, what we could embrace, what we could take forward. Um, and I think the concept too about bringing together a group. Um, and it sounds like, you know, at least based on what I've heard, this is such a transdisciplinary arena that it almost sounds like bringing together people from multiple disciplines to really talk about the exposome and to maybe even jump in and start to think about the NIH definition um, could be of value. So a tremendous amount of input from all of you um, in an incredibly short time. So just um, other thoughts. We have a couple of minutes left um, before we're supposed to adjourn. And I'm just curious what other thoughts people might have um, that haven't been shared yet. Michelle, we, we only have five minutes left. I'm just wondering if, if, if I could ask the group, uh, Walter talked about lighting the, what is it, striking the match and lighting the fire. So could we talk a little bit about how, I think there's a lot of interest, a lot of enthusiasm, as you've just pointed out, there are lots of moving parts here. Uh, what's the next step? I mean, what, what do we do to light the match, which potentially could be used to light the fuse? <laughs> and you know, get something going. Is there a workshop that we, we should, maybe a National Academy workshop, pull together some ideas, or what do we think is the next step? Because it would be nice to think that you know, this robust discussion that we're having today could actually be followed with something that now creates that, uh, that framework and creates a, a definition of what is the exposome. And so we all can be rallying around a common set of principles. 
Well, let me ask, let me ask Gary. You, you've obviously thought a lot about this. So I'll put you on the spot. You got your camera on. Um, so what are your, what are your thoughts about what's, uh, how do we light the match? Yeah, I, I think it's time for our SLMR. I mean, we, we need to get the right people in a room locked in to walk out with a plan a very, and a very NIH focused plan. It's like an NIH wide plan. Uh, you know, it, it's just something where there is a lot of, there, there's too much to do. We have to come up with some focus. We have to have this sort of operational definition, but it has to be tied in, like you said, like to a, a pitch to the common fund or a pitch for ARPA. Like it has to be tied into something where it's not just pie in the sky, but look, this is something we could actually, and if we could, if we, if people were motivated to think that there actually would be an end game where there'd be resources, I think we could get people together to say, let's, let's do it. Let's come up and come up with these working definitions and, and just make it happen. I think you have to, yeah, have to work backwards from deliverables. What is it, what is it that you want to deliver and what does it take to get there? And then, that, you know, that's, that's a tough discussion because then you got to make some choices. Yeah, I think that I think getting a good definition of what are the deliverables, you know, what do we want to deliver is is really important. And it has to relate back to the the types of diseases that you're studying, Walter, and that uh, we're studying across the NIH. Yeah. So how's the best way to get the environment integrated into uh, studying the etiology of human disease? Other thoughts? We only have four minutes left. So. Well, all I, I'm going to just say one thing that you know, hopefully 100 years from now, people are going to look back and say, boy, they were stupid. There's a million things that they should have been doing. <laughs> uh, I think it's, you know, it's out there. You know, it's, it's misty, hard to see through the clouds. But you know, there's money in those hills, just how to, how to, how to focus and, you know, some gold to begin with so you get bigger investment. I think that's the trick. It's definitely the thing to do. Yeah. Um, we've only got a couple minutes yet uh, left. Uh, Irva quickly, and then maybe Jan quickly. Yeah, building on the the deliverables and working back, and and you know, Gary mentioned a couple of of the 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 source kinds of funding, and I think you know, it's the sort of thing that that you folks at the institute know, which is uh, you put out the right kinds of of mechanisms. And uh, the experts will, will will come who have the, the the talent and skills and interest in in uh, in in getting to those deliverables. Um, and I think the team science and the collaborations that are needed in in this era of, of uh, you know the, the unifying everything from the molecular up to the spatial and you know atmospheric and so forth um, is uh, it, it is highly collaborative and and I think where we've seen successes is where uh, those collaborations are, are, are starting to happen so you know putting out the the right kinds of calls that will uh, will get people talking to the collaborators they need to be talking to and get them working together seems to me to be what's worked in the past and is likely to to work um, with the right framework uh, for the, the, those uh, those mechanisms. Thanks, Irva. Jan, you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, the the thing that um, I wanted to say is that you know we've got some amazing examples of how um, various programs have worked in an inter interdisciplinary way um, to define and engage. Um, the Brain Initiative, um, Alzheimer's Research, um, the Cancer Moonshot. You know, I think those are the kinds of um, large scale projects that are going to be what we need um, in order to be able to tackle this kind of a big problem. Um, I think the problem with the environment, of course, is that it doesn't have your favorite disease necessarily linked to it. And so, but yet there are many. Um, and so that whole idea of, of 
sort of how do you craft your message so that you be, can begin to um, talk about how important the environment is. I, I think that this clearly there's a lot of groundwork that has to be done, but this is really an amazing time um, when climate change is being talked about again, when people are thinking about environmental influences on, um, on health and disease. And um, I think it really is the time for us to be really digging in and doing this. Um, so um, this has been a great discussion. Nice to be living in an area where science is good <laughs> again. Um, it's Michelle, I, I see we're at time and we're beginning to lose a few people. Um, Bob, any, any last profound comment you want to make before we wind up? I don't, I don't know if it's profound, but I, I think the argument to make is that environment plays a role in every disease, even Mendelian diseases. Environment's going to play a role in how severe the disease is, and therefore every institute really needs to invest in exposomics. Yes, that was profound, Bob. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> so, Michelle, any parting comments before I kind of wind things up? No, please go ahead, Rick, and wind wind things up. Okay, so we're at, actually running a minute over. So let me let me just personally thank uh, Walter and Gary. Uh, Walter, for you know, it's just been great working with you, and I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today. Hopefully, it was helpful for you to get some insights from the environmental health sciences community. I mean, we're committed. We're going to work with you, and we're going to make some things happen. And Gary, you know, thank you for kind of boldly stepping forward here and pro providing the leadership that you've been providing for the the Exposome framework. So we'll continue to work with you. And so let's uh, just see how we can light that match and light the fuse. Also, David Belshaw is here someplace. Uh, actually, I was pulling out my email to uh, to uh, ask David to chime in. So I was very pleased that he did that. Um, so I thought it was a great discussion today. So I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. So let's see, Gary uh, Ellison. So do you want to make any final comments before we adjourn? Thank you, Rick. And thank you all for a great discussion. I thought it was a great day today. I appreciate your, your time and your attendance here today. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at, what time are we? Or is tomorrow afternoon? No, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Earlier for some Eastern time. Okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>